Hello and welcome to From No Crypto to No Crypto. This is Blockchain Wayne bringing you another cryptocurrency podcast. Today's episode brought to us by CoinSierra Club, mobile private key wallet and point of sale solution. Today's episode also brought to us by Crypto Current Conference in New Orleans, March 14th and 15th. First crypto and blockchain conference in New Orleans for 2019. Get your tickets today at www.crypto-current.co. Once again, that is www.crypto-currentconf.co. All right, so let's take a look today. I really wanted to dive in and take a look at what is going on in the tokenization field as far as many assets are talked about being tokenized and how can the blockchain be utilized to, to tokenize uh, both physical and digital assets. Uh, Starting with, there was an article posted sometime last week, uh, and the title was Tesla stock on a blockchain offers a hint of where crypto could be headed. There's a digital exchange that's opening this week. Oh, this was what was released last week. It's going to enable investors to trade in companies, including Apple, Facebook, Tesla, outside of the U.S., even when the stock market is closed. They will be creating tokens. Um, that will be backed by the, by the actual stocks. Now, DX.exchange has offices in Estonia and Israel. They're going to offer digital tokens based on a share of 10 NASDAQ listed companies. And they do have plans to expand to the New York Stock Exchange as well in Tokyo and also in Hong Kong. So each digital security is backed by one regular share and holders will be entitled to the same cash dividends, even though the companies themselves aren't involved. So the exchange's virtual stock offering will provide a test of investor appetite for products that seek to improve upon mainstream financial markets by using technology from the world of cryptocurrencies. So DX is going to offer digital stocks, which is going to be called tokens, based on actual shares bought and held by their partner, MPS, Marketplace Securities Limited. So the token is going to be based on the Ethereum network with the amount corresponding to demand on the DX exchange. So a couple of things to look at this one. I look at this personally. Okay. I see, I see where they're going with this. This could be quite interesting, being able to trade shares 24 hours a day. One thing I do like about crypto markets is that if you are in the trading, you can be trading 24 hours a day, whereas typically stock markets, you're dealing with a Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. Uh, local time of the, of the actual stock exchanges. So this could provide some, some more ability to trade, but there are some questions. So MPS Marketplace, they're going to, hold the stocks, right? But do they actually hold the stocks or do they hold the rights to the stocks? Because as you all know, paper stocks are not issued anymore. These stocks are held by a, a giant firm up, you know, that, that basically just handles settlement day to day. But when you buy a stock, whether it's through one of the holding companies, you don't necessarily see that stock at all. So will they actually hold the physical, you know, hold stock papers or will they just have uh, the ownership of those stocks? on a particular exchange. It's gonna be interesting to see how that shakes out. But there's been a lot of talk of tokenizing different things. You know, back in, in October, we saw an article for, uh, 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 it's a first in Manhattan, a $30 million real estate property was tokenized on the blockchain, which allowed investors to buy a share. So maybe someone can't afford to invest in a $30 million real estate property, or maybe you just never had access to be part of that sale. Whereas in this case, you could buy tokens that represent a, a particular share of that building. So these are still early stages, but a lot showing what could possibly happen. Um, you bought, there's also been, uh, you know, discussions during events focused on blockchain technology. Um, you know, looking at the billion dollar art market. So specifically in terms of ability to tokenize artwork and to also offer investments to multiple shareholders through fractionalization. You've never been able to own part of a Van Gogh, but if you could own part of a Van Gogh, would you purchase that? Would it be tokenized on the blockchain? Um, you know, crypto provides a trustless environment, but when you start including physical assets, there's gotta be some level of trust from a third party intermediary. There will be some centralization at some point, not necessarily on the blockchain, but controlling the link of the physical act physical asset to the digital asset. So, um, and this was, you know, the art piece, something I was talking about uh, several weeks ago in Miami's Art Week. Um, art Basel was, was a, um, an event that we saw, you know, a lot, of, a lot of crypto people flocking to it just as well as art people. A blockchain and cryptocurrency enthusiasts 
gathered alongside art collectors, billionaire investors, and uh, colorful fashionistas during during Miami's Art Week. Um, so it was an event hosted by billionaire Adam Lindemann, who's an avid art collector, has been also been studying blockchain technology for over a year now. Um, you know, technically speaking, you can tokenize any asset uh, when you think about it, but doesn't make sense to have it tokenized. Um, you know, part of what you know what was mentioned by uh, was basically the design and most common use case for tokenization is for assets that have real world value, such as artwork. And once these assets are tokenized, which is the process of converting their ownership into digital tokens that can be purchased, traded, or simply held, these items can be made available for fractional ownership. Um, so that's another big piece of that. Uh, you know, it's a big trend we're starting to see in the art community, and my guess is we'll see it pop up uh, in other avenues as well. We saw another article posted recently back in the middle of December, German railway operator Douche von AG. Uh, DB, which is partnered with blockchain integration platform Unibright, and they're examining the possibility. Now, this is just the possibility of tokenizing its ecosystem. So, a press release revealed the partnership uh, back on December 18th. Uh, DB appointed Unibright to make preparations for an internal workshop dedicated to the possible tokenization of the company's assets. The railway giant, which is considered to be the largest in Europe, wants to find out whether decentralized solutions can cut operational costs and help DB interact with other members of the travel industry. So this is not just about being able to fraction it up and allow people to invest. They're wondering if tokenizing can allow them to cut operational costs and also be able to network better throughout the industry. So interesting to see what's going to happen here. Uh, another development I saw just, just yesterday on, on the blockchain, was a news article based out of Nevada. So Nevada issued almost 1,000 marriage certificates on the Ethereum blockchain, but government acceptance tend to vary, and actual public acceptance tend to vary. Out of those 1,000 marriage certificates, talking to the people that, that were issued them in Nevada, some people were for it, some people were still leery of it. This is a new technology. It's gonna take some time for people to adapt it. Many people just wanted the old school marriage certificate, but it, is, it does show another use case for Ethereum blockchain items being able to be, uh, you know, transacted on the blockchain. And also my guess is there was some sort of smart contract involved with this, uh, these Ethereum marriage contracts. So that's a lot of what's going on in, in the, in the tokenization space. Uh, really, what does it mean? You know, because when you tokenize something, who holds the physical asset, right? And, and here's some things to think about, right? Say property is tokenized in this case, and a $30 million real estate property, you know, you lose your private keys to access uh, your ownership of that token, and you could be able to lose your ability to, to claim that ownership or to be able to partake in any profits from that, right? And that, that's one of the things that, that many people have to realize, but also when you think about it, what if you narrowed it down, say to one property, right? If you would tokenize a physical property and you buy that property completely, not partial ownership, say your house, and you lose those private keys, or someone hacks you and gains access to those private keys, how are you gonna be able to prove your ownership of it? And those are, those are some problems. I'm not saying that that's something that's gonna stop this tokenization process, but those are questions and hurdles that have to be answered for us to be able to see more items being able to be tokenized on the blockchain. And to be quite honest with you, if there is not a problem with it before, there's not a problem with ownership or being able to prove, you know, the art one I totally get because being able to prove that the person you're buying from is not a fraud, that they actually hold it because you can look back on the blockchain and see transactions that lead up to that person obtaining that particular piece of art, that helps prevent fraud. So that's a huge problem in the world today that blockchain can solve, right? But tokenizing a house just to tokenize a house does not necessarily solve any problem, right? Now, if you find a way to streamline it and cut out a lot of intermediaries and cut costs to where transfer a house can be a lot easier instead of having to play all these third-party intermediaries, now we're talking. But I think what you're going to see over the next couple years, say couple years, is you're going to see a lot of assets talked about and even tested with being tokenized. But at the end of the day, some processes will not work for this technology. And some of them, it may work, but there's really no need because it doesn't solve any kind of a problem. 
But in instances where allowing your everyday Joe to be able to invest in a $30 million real estate property, that, that does solve a real world problem, you know, because only the rich can invest in that. And if they partner together with other rich friends and they come up with the 30 million, they can buy the property. But this allows you to take out that and anybody can participate, right? And as I mentioned with the art, uh, a lot of things can happen where you can prevent fraud through blockchain. Now, being able to purchase the stock, they, they said what they're trying to solve. I will be watching this project closely just to see how it unfolds because I am very interested to see if this, because this is obviously just going to be a test offering 10 NASDAQ listed companies, but will it, will it expand? And then also how, how, how big will the demand be, right? Because you think about it, are people in other countries wanting to be able to invest in these other, in these stocks? And if they can get access to that, not only that, but able to trade it 24 hours a day, but then what's going to happen to your after hours trading price, right? Will it just be based off of the price it closes at? Or will there be price manipulation one way or another from your buy and sell orders of those stocks? So a lot to happen, a lot more to come, but curious to see what happens here. So that was the biggest topic I want to talk about today. I've got a few other smaller topics I wanted to bring up uh, just in light of what's recently happened. So there's a lot of talk, a lot of people still waiting for a decision on Bitcoin ETF, right? You've got Van X, you even had the Winklevoss, they're trying to get another ETF approved. The Winklevoss twins were right at about 10, 10 or 11 months ago were denied an ETF, uh, denied multiple times last year. Still trying to make the case for it. Um, Gemini, which is the Winklevoss twins, uh, that is their trading exchange that they use. And they also have the Gemini USD, which is a stable coin. Uh, Gemini has met all of the requirements for New York. New York is very, uh, very strict when it comes to crypto regulations and laws and many exchanges and other things uh, tend to avoid New York just because it's so, it's so complex. But the Winklevoss twins are trying to appeal to the SEC uh, to approve their ETF. And what we saw over the last week is just they've been spamming New Yorkers with their ads, right? And their ads are, are posted everywhere on subway and bus stops and, and every which way we've seen slogans such as the revolution needs rules, money has a future. And we also seen it say crypto without chaos has sprung up everywhere. Um, you know, calling for crypto with regulations, basically showing that they're trying to be pro crypto, but a lot of crypto people that, that join this to eliminate the greed and the corruption and the need to trust some regulatory body don't really agree with the Winklevoss twins. And we've seen quite a few variations of the Winklevoss signs popping up where people have Photoshopped them. And particularly I like those a lot better, but you know, there's something to be aware of. That's what's going on in the crypto space in New York. Uh, so if you see signs for Gemini or if you see you post them, a lot of them are showing up online. Uh, that's really what the Winklevoss twins are trying to do. And they're not trying to say that, that we need a big crackdown on crypto. They're trying to show that they're pro uh, regulations, pro, uh, you know, which, which get, you know, leads to some controversy, but it's, 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 I think it's their way of trying to sweet talk uh, the New Yorkers and the SEC into approving their, ETF. So we'll see what happens with that, with that, but just wanted to cover that. Uh, if you hadn't seen those pop up, they're popping up pretty much all over Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, so a couple of the articles that were in the news uh, today, uh, the nano cryptocurrency is facing a second class action lawsuit over a BitGrail hack. Now, the reason I bring this up, BitGrail is a, is an exchange that is basically insolvent. It was hacked last year. Uh, Nano is something that was held on there. That was the main cryptocurrency of that exchange. And it was severely, severely drained. Uh, I personally had some, some Nano on, on the BitGrail exchange because that was the only place at the time that you could buy it. And there was a hack where it basically drained the whole thing. So we're all still waiting to see what's going to happen. Are we going to get any kind of money back? Now, of course, the value of Nano has dropped drastically, just like all of the cryptocurrencies over the last 12 months. But the reason I bring this up is because this is a perfect example why we had the proof of keys the other day. So the proof of keys was many people were withdrawing their crypto from exchanges to be able to put them into wallets where they hold the private keys. Because if you don't hold the private keys, it's not really your crypto. 
just like this, right? I, this was my crypto in the big girl exchange. What happened? The exchange gets hacked. It's gone, right? But because it was a maybe a decentralized currency, but it is held on a centralized exchange. So this is uh, this is a perfect example of why I wanted to revisit the, the piece of why you want to make sure that you only have one exchange is what you plan on trading, right? If you plan on holding something for a while, they're not going to trade it right away. Then don't hold it on exchanges. Hold it in somewhere where you hold a private key. Your your biggest ones are your your hard wallets, your hardware wallets. You've got the uh, Trezor, and you've also got the Nano Ledger, the Nano Ledger S. But also just just announced today at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, you have Nano announced their Nano X which is Bluetooth enabled to help interact with mobile devices. So that is the next level of crypto hard wallets. So it's got a bigger, brighter screen and you've got Bluetooth capabilities, which allows it to interact with more devices as many people may be accessing on the go. So make sure you're holding one of those. Also, if you haven't seen, if you go to Nano Ledger's website, they were offering the Ledger S's, which is still a great hardware piece, uh, at thirty percent off, and and we were kind of figured that meant that something new was coming out, but it doesn't make the other one obsolete. You just have to be able to utilize a computer or a desktop or a laptop computer to be able to access your crypto funds, but allows you to store it securely. Right. Second case where you may be able to store crypto without uh, store crypto where you hold your private keys could be on a software wallet. Right. There's a couple of them out there. One I like the best is Exodus. If you go to Exodus.io, you can download their wallet, and it's 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 got a smooth user interface. It works great. I've even experienced where my computer had crashed, had to get it restored, and when I went to restore the wallet, once I entered my my private keys, everything was still there. Now with anything, whether it's the Ledger, whether it's the Trezor hardware wallets, or a digital, you know, a downloadable wallet, make sure that you are protecting your private keys. You are the bank, you're the security, and storing them as on a digital file on your computer is not a good suggestion because if your computer gets hacked, someone's gonna find it, right? I've heard of case, you know, and about a year ago, I heard a case of someone who had over $100,000 worth of crypto stolen from his Exodus account. Now, did Exodus get hacked? Absolutely not. What happened was, he stored his private key, his backup key, in his Gmail email address. So what happened, someone was able to hack his Gmail account from there, get his backup keys, and use that to access the crypto. So it's all about you protecting your information. Uh, I did an episode, several episodes ago, with a guy that created the Safe Ledger. Now, a guy named Philip. Now, if you go back to that, that episode, you can see Safe Ledger is another option which allows you to store your private keys on a USB flash drive, but it is removed from the internet. Uh, it doesn't leave any trace on the computer, and that is an option. One thing I personally talk about is keeping a paper written copy in a safe. <coughs> so just to tell you my current protocol right now, got my backup private keys stored on my safe ledger, and then I also have another copy stored on a paper in a safe, in a safe place. <laughs> Uh, in a fireproof safe. So I've got a backup uh, and get a backup of your backup, right? Because you are the security. One thing people want decentralized technology. They don't want corrupt entities interacting with or controlling when or where you can access your money. But if that's the case, you got to take control. You got to take ownership as well. So that's what proof of keys was. So I brought up this big girl hack, uh, not really to talk much about big girl, but just to show you that was a perfect example of a centralized exchange and I truly did not have that crypto because it was hacked and drained. And guess what? Guess who had the private keys for that, that exchange? The exchange did, right? So if you're using a decentralized exchange, then you're act, interacting peer-to-peer -peer and you hold your own um, private keys. We still got a ways to go on decentralized exchanges. Now, Wave does have one that's been operating for some time. I've used it quite a bit. But other than that, there's nothing wrong with having crypto on exchange if you're going to be actively trading it. But if you're not going to be actively trading it, move it somewhere safe and secure to make sure that you truly own that cryptocurrency. All right. So that is it for our episode today. Uh, covered a few topics, some that were really hot on my mind over the last few days. Could have probably made an episode into each one, but wanted to 
really cover those just to just to update that. Um, that is it for the episode content today. Just a reminder, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we are holding a crypto conference in New Orleans, the Cryptocurrent Conference, March 14th and 15th. Uh, make sure to you can get tickets now at www.crypto-current.com.co. And once you get tickets, we have early bird tickets going on for another nine more days. So until January 15th, we'll have early bird tickets. Use the discount code Wayne. That's right, blockchain Wayne. Use Wayne, W-A-Y-N-E, to get an additional discount and come see us at that conference. We'll be this conference will appeal to anywhere from the novice, the beginner, the person that knows nothing about cryptocurrency. And, but it'll also provide for those of you in the crypto space to network and, and meet some of the faces and people that are that are in the crypto space in New Orleans. Uh, you know, there's been conferences held in Vegas and LA and Miami, but let me just tell you, New Orleans, the big easy is the place to be in March. So make sure you come on down and check it out. So that's it for episode today. I want to thank you all for listening and we will catch you on the next episode.